Okay, good morning. We're, uh, we're ready to begin the session here. Um, this is a, uh, a special session that's been co-organized by the International Astronautical Federation and the Association of Space Explorers. And uh, so we have a panel of uh, space travelers here. Uh, in the, a moment, I'll ask them all to introduce themselves briefly, although I, I think uh, uh, none of them really needs an introduction. They're, they're well known in our community, but we'll, we'll, we'll have some brief introductions, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion, and you'll uh, have an opportunity to ask questions uh, through the Slido app, and then we'll select some of those to, uh, to keep the discussion going. So just uh, as a background context for this, for this panel, we live in a quite an interesting time today in the, in the space world in general. Uh, we see space exploration, both human and robotic, becoming um, increasingly, uh, having increasing involvement of the commercial uh, space industry. So it's not just agencies, it, there's private industry that are putting together space missions. There's cooperative activities between governmental agencies and private industry. We have, uh, we have even the world of, of uh, human space travel itself changing to be not just exclusively national or international agencies that are sending astronauts, but we have uh, uh, private citizens that are flying into space. We have some, some uh, examples of that here. We have uh, uh, companies that are, are uh, filming projects in space. Um, so it is a very interesting time. We, we, it's also the case that humanity as a, as a whole has an extreme interest in space. And I'm not talking about us here in the space world, but those that have nothing to do with space. You can see every time there's a new Star Trek film, Star Wars film come out, the enthusiasm that the general public has. It's the, just uh, the uh, science fiction world that's attracting them. And the ability to connect with the real world of space travel is becoming ever closer for them. And so I think one of the roles we all in the space community, but especially those that have had the, uh, the chance to fly into space, is to act as a kind of inspiration for, for humanity as a whole. So perhaps we can touch a bit on that theme as well. Uh, so with that, uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me perhaps uh, ask our panels to briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll get into some uh, discussion of these themes. So let's perhaps just follow along from uh, from left to right or left to right to left, depending <laughs> your view. Andre, please, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andre Kuipers. I'm an uh, astronaut from ESA, and it all started, like you said, with science fiction for me. Uh, I wanted to see the Earth from outer space, and that was fantastic, so it was a dream. It didn't exist in Europe. It was something for US test pilots and uh, cosmonauts. And so uh, it was, so I, I, but I still want to do something with spaceflight. I became a medical doctor based on the science fiction books as well. And then uh, I wanted to make the combination. So I started to work for the European Space Agency as a medical doctor, as a, as a uh, project scientist, coordinating experiments that we did, uh, that ESA did with the space on Space Shuttle and on Mir. Until there was an opportunity for a uh, next selection process, which is pretty rare in, uh, in Europe. I was so lucky to be selected. If not, I would have, well, uh, found, uh, found, uh, uh, worked a lot for a lot of money to go to space anyway, like is now possible. So I understand that dream very much. Um, I was so lucky to uh, be assigned uh, to two missions, two times to the space station uh, with Soyuz, 2004 and 2012. Uh, fantastic. What I also like very much in the, in the whole thing is the, the international cooperation, working with all these different nationalities, different disciplines. So um, I want to be part uh, of, the, of the progress of humankind, what we're all doing here now. So that's, uh, that's, that was the major goal, and I was so lucky to, uh, to do that also uh, as a professional astronaut in the International Space Station. And, um, but, but it started all with a passion for space, and uh, I wanted to do something there, whatever. Okay, great. Great, thank you, uh, Andre. Um, Sergey, over to you. I think you're certainly one of those that's had a, the most experience in space, having for, I think, many years held the, the record of time in space. Please uh, share us a few thoughts of your experience. Um, I probably will echo Andrew saying that 
uh, my way to uh, to space program start also from science fiction. Uh, we, we read a lot of books, and also I thought that although uh, space program already existed at that time in uh, Russia and Soviet Union, but uh, I knew that probability to become part of this team is so low that uh, I need to decide what I like to do if I wouldn't be a um, uh, cosmonaut or astronaut. Uh, I decided to work in, in space program, in space industry. Um, that's why I started uh, my study as a rocket engineer. Uh, came to company that built uh, spacecraft and I was lucky to, to become part of uh, space flyers. My first flight was a uh, long time ago, 1988. It was expedition for a Mir station, and it was already international expedition because we flew together with our uh, French friend Jean Luc Etienne. And, and uh, actually, all my six flights uh, were one or another way international uh, adventure. Uh, it, it just started uh, in end of 80s uh, when we flew on Mir, and then my, my second flight <coughs> was also on Mir station, and it was basically two expedition, Expedition 9 and Expedition uh, 10 in one flight. Uh, so I stayed pretty long period of time at that time on the station, and also it was uh, international missions uh, in the beginning, in the middle, at the end of my flight. And right after that, I was assigned to to new program uh, because after Apollo Soyuz, uh, we didn't have any joint flights with NASA for more than 15 years. So decisions were made that one Russian will fly on shuttle, one American fly on uh, Soyuz and on Mir station. So I was selected to fly this mission on shuttle. So it was very interesting experience for me to uh, get training in another system, to have, uh, to know new uh, hardware, to have new friends uh, in NASA. So. Uh, it was my third flight. Uh, fourth flight was uh, first assembly flight uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, we were assigned already at that time to Expedition 1, to long duration mission, but um, before that, uh, the first flight for to assemble two modules was um, shuttle flight when node was uh, docked with FGB launched from Kazakhstan. So I was part of this mission, and uh, soon after that, uh, Bill Shepard, Yuri Gizenko, and I uh, start permanent presence uh, human on ISS in year 2000 as Expedition 1. Uh, so I, then I flew another uh, flight in 2005. Uh, it was Expedition 11. Uh, unfortunately, it was time when uh, shuttle was grounded after um, accident after, after catastrophe, and it was only crew of two. So John Phillips and I uh, was flying um, Expedition 11 on ISS. <coughs> so that's basically it about my space flight. Great, thank you, Sergey. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think one of the things I take out of that is the um, the importance of human space flight and building bridges internationally, uh, globally, and and we I think we've got some good examples of this here on the panel as well. Uh, Chris, uh, I think the m probably the most uh, the recent uh, addition to the uh, the spacefaring. Uh, uh, camaraderie we've got on the on the panel here. Please share us your uh, your thoughts. Yeah, so I, I flew to space on uh, New Shepard uh, NS18 a mere 15 days ago, um, so it's quite exciting for me to be up here. So this is actually uh, my 20th year of uh, coming to IAC, um, and I, as I said earlier this morning, every good thing that really ever happened to me in my career has actually come out of this community. So I just want to thank everyone for convening and 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 assembling here and making some fairly fantastic space programs around the world happen. It's truly remarkable what, what we can all achieve. So my story to space, I, I kind of grew up with a, a strange uh, thing in my brain where I believed that up and up and down were equally um, acceptable to move in as left, right, and forwards and backwards. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, if someone said to you, you can't walk forward, you can move left and you can move right, but you're not allowed to walk forwards or backwards. That's how I feel about space, and it's just always seemed natural to me that we should go to space and illogical that we don't. Um, and so I have my whole life wanted to go and make this happen. When I was 17, I, I grew up in Australia where there was no space program to speak of. And I think many people can relate to having countries that have none or emerging space programs. Um, 
And so I thought, well, why don't I become a test pilot and get transferred to NASA, as many other great role models have done. So I went and applied for the Australian Air Force only to discover that I was colorblind, which no one had ever told me before. So I was permanently disqualified for service in the Australian military um, because of this disability. It's fairly mild, I can see some colors, but um, and after that I could not, that door closed to me. Also when I was uh, 19, had a terrible motorcycle accident and broke both my legs in eight places and had about 15 surgeries after that, which basically permanently closed the door on me becoming any kind of professional astronaut. Um, and so I resolved in that moment to get myself to space as, as uh, Andre said, you know, some way or other I was gonna make it happen. And I was very fortunate in 2002 to come to the World Space Congress IAC and the Space Generation Congress in Houston where actually one of the speakers was, uh, was Mr. Krikalov here. So um, that began the real journey of me figuring out how I can contribute to, to space exploration, get involved and um, figure out how to get more citizens into space. So I'm really honored and privileged to have flown to space through the hard work of this community and uh, thank you for making that happen. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, let's uh, move on then to uh, Aza. I think uh, in terms of inspiring uh, local communities and, and areas that have had a more limited experience with space, I think you're right there at the forefront of that. Please uh, share us a bit of your experience. Yes, definitely, yes. Coming from this country, hello everyone first, Hamad uh, Zain Mansouri. Uh, I had the privilege to be the first uh, UAE astronaut in space and to experience this uh, feeling of uh, being in space and weightlessness. Coming from this country where uh, to be an astronaut was impossible uh, and achieve it and achieve my, my childhood dream to be an astronaut, it was a really amazing thing. And uh, to see this, the effect of that in the whole next generation here and the youth of our country and the region. Uh, so it was an amazing experience for me and uh, I had the privilege to be the first astronaut. But I believe here in our country, we are believing in, um, in sustainability and to have a long term um, present in space, human, fl human space flight. And um, I was the, in the first batch of uh, candidates here in the United Arab Emirates, uh, side by side with my colleague Sultan al Niyadi. We've been selected in 2017, uh, at the end of 2017, uh, and from there, we trained with our colleague uh, at uh, Roscosmos, Star City, for in preparation for the first mission. Um, I spent space uh, seven days, 21 hours, and one minute. It was amazing uh, experience, and to work with different nations from different countries uh, on that endeavor, and uh, to do a lot of uh, scientific experiments on board the station from different uh, agencies, Roscosmos, ESA, and uh, NASA. Uh, this is what it's all about, the space. It's about uh, science and about collaboration to go uh, further in space and to explore even uh, deeper. So uh, I learned that uh, when I was there on board the station looking at Earth uh, and having this lesson of there is no border between countries. And this is a big lesson for everyone here. Uh, if we want to go uh, and explore even further, uh, deeper in space, we have to work together. And I'm really excited to be uh, with the people here and this uh, panel and uh, to experience our uh, experiments and uh, our feelings about how we've been in space and what we did to reach that point in our life. And uh, I'm really excited to see different like people from different countries and the uh, accessibility of space is being now even easier for everyone to be there. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for those uh, introductory words there. Um, let's move right along. Uh, Jessica, you've certainly done your fair share of inspiring people in space. Uh, please share us uh, some of your experiences. Hello everybody, my name is Jessica Meir and I'm a NASA astronaut currently. My childhood as well was similar to a lot of these people on stage. I, I wanted to be an astronaut from the time that I was five years old. And although I'm only a first generation American, I was an American. So it was a little bit more of a realistic dream for me, I guess, than, than for some of these people, um, for Haza. But I previously worked as a physiologist, a biologist. I had this passion for space, but at the same time, my favorite subject as a kid was biology. So I really pursued those two tracks in parallel. 
And I was working as a scientist in academia, studying the physiology of animals in extreme environments. So deep diving animals like emperor penguins in the Antarctic, elephant seals, and also high altitude birds. So probably not that surprising that I had this interest in the extreme environments and extreme physiology and one day ended up having that dream come true and now I'm the one in the ultimate of the extreme environments kind of paying my dues for doing all the experiments on animals in the past. Now I'm the one being poked and prodded in the name of science. So I flew on the International Space Station fairly recently on Expedition 61 and 62. And again, really embodying that spirit of international cooperation. I flew on a Russian rocket, on a Soyuz rocket, and had the privilege of flying with this gentleman right here. So the partnership that we have created between, between all of our countries, Russia, NASA, and now MBRSC, along with our other international partners, is, is really a privilege to, to be a part of. I was on a space station for 205 days, so almost seven months. A little bit longer than Huzzah, but I know they'll be up there with a long duration mission soon as well. Looking forward to continuing with this spirit of international cooperation and exploration. Thank you. And then uh, we go to Oleg, someone with ex extensive uh, spaceflight experience as a cosmonaut as well. Please uh, share us a few thoughts and your background. Yeah, hello, everyone. So this is. Uh, uh, I'll start saying about uh, my biography, may, maybe better to say, so I'm a medical doctor in my background, uh, so I'm a physiologist, and uh, like at Jessica, I start working in the uh, space industry in the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center as a flight surgeon and as a physiologist and specialist in aerospace medicine. And, uh, after uh, my selection uh, to Cosmonaut Corps, after many years of training, I flew three times on board ISS, uh, three times as a crew, Soyuz commander and twice as a ISS commander. And uh, I'm lucky because I flew in different uh, stages. Uh, first uh, flight during the construction uh, phase of ISS, second uh, in transition stage, and third one uh, in utilization stage. And so believe me, it's absolutely different uh, uh, flights and uh, absolutely different station. So um, now I'm retired uh, from Cosmonaut Corps and working in Institute of Biomedical uh, Problem in Moscow. So this institute is a uh, uh, leading organization in space medicine in Russia. So I wor uh, continue working on space uh, life science uh, aboard the ISS as well and uh, working on uh, some technologies we need for long distance uh, and long duration flights in our future. As well, I am a president of Association, of Association Space Explorers, and it's a, you know, it's a very organization which we're working to sh and um, combine people, uh, flyers from many countries uh, to share our experience. And just um, next week, we're going to have the next Congress in Budapest uh, to meet together to discuss our perspective because now you know we live in a very interesting world now. So we are uh, more and more of, we are talking about flying on professionals in space. I don't like this word on professionals. Uh, sometimes maybe better civilian astronaut, uh, but people who flew to space, not because it's part of their job or uh, just flying in different purposes, uh, maybe to make science, maybe just, uh, get some space experience, maybe to do something like that. So that's uh, now we in the in, uh, in life, in the world, when we have professionals and non-professionals in space. And, and I think it's a very interesting topic to discuss today as well. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, let me let the audience know, I, the Slido app should be open. If you, if you have an interesting question, please put it in there and we'll try and get to uh, as many of those as we can. Um, so let, let me begin with a question. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, professional and civilian astronauts. There's certainly a uh, one can characterize space travelers in different ways: professional and civilian. Um, there are those that are still active uh, astronauts here. Some that are already retired. Uh, some that were more uh, professionally responsible for the the operation of the vehicles, and others that were more focused on the scientific investigation, no matter what that, uh, what that 
role that you had when you flew in space was, and whether you're active or not as, a, as an astronaut right now, how important is the work that you do that perhaps we think of as really a secondary role, which is really being an ambassador for the space world to the broader community? How, how important is that in, in what you're doing today? And uh, I think in many ways, those that have traveled in space really represent the space world to the broader, to broader humanity. Uh, how important is delivering that message for, for, for what you're doing? And open question to anyone who would like to answer. Well, I think it's an incredibly important role. I think that all of us take this as a, a very large responsibility as part of our career. You know, at NASA, that is one of our main missions, to engage the public, to, in to regularly do this kind of outreach, whether it's to schools and public organizations and audiences like this one. So I absolutely do think it is our role to continue to inspire. We know that so many people have this fascination with space and the same dream that we have. We're just the people that have been fortunate enough to, to realize that. And there are so many other people that are equally as qualified, but there's so much luck and timing involved as well. So I do think it's a huge responsibility. Probably has, a, has something to say about that, having b really bared most <laughs> of that burden um, recently. Uh, first of all, I disagree with you. It's not a secondary like role, it is a primary role. As an uh, astronaut, we inherited this privilege and uh, we inherited this responsibility to, uh, to uh, s share with everyone here on ground our uh, vintage point being in space and looking at Earth from there. And uh, the effect of astronauts and people is really uh, like amazing. I saw that in, in the kids here and the youth in our country. Coming from a country with uh, no future be uh, previous uh, space program, human space flight, uh, we felt that. And every day that we went to school together with my colleagues uh, Jessica and uh, Sultan, uh, we saw the effect of that in the, s in the kids. And uh, we will see the effect on them actually after 20 years, not now. Most of them maybe will pursue STEM education, uh, something that because of that visit we did. So it is really important. Uh, everyone he thought that that's not just doing space experiments and that's it doing his mission, and after that, he's gonna be just doing nothing. No, he should transfer this experiment experience to everyone. And this is really important, even if it's really short flight or long flight. It uh, doesn't make any difference. The just being in space by itself is a, is a big privilege for each one of us here. And we have to really uh, embrace that and make sure that we share it with everyone. And uh, I'm, I'm always emphasizing and just make sure that after you being in space, make sure that you transfer that to the next generation and youth. Yeah, Chris so I, people often ask me, why did I get on the second flight of New Shepard, right? And I think in particular, New Shepard is a particularly safe vehicle, but it's still a rocket and it was only the second flight and there's, there are incumbent risks with getting on any, any rocket as everyone here knows. So I made that decision because I, feel like we are at a turning point in history and and, I, and as you know, both these folks have said, we have to communicate that out and inspire people. And you know, as a member of this community, I wanted first of all to let everyone here know that something new and exciting is coming, but also the world at large, inspire them that, you know, whether you, you know, were not a professional astronaut, you didn't go to NASA, you didn't grow up in a country that had a space agency, um, it, that door is opening up. I also flew as the first Australian who did not need to get American citizenship. I'm still just an Australian Australian or an Aussie Aussie as we call them. Um, and so that was, you know, that's, that's new that that can happen. It's amazing that you could fly. And so I think this is the beginning of something really important and I wanted to fly on New Shepard at this moment in time to make that statement to the world that this is the beginning of something really exciting. Great, thank you. Sergey. I probably will add a little bit that uh, you probably I'll just remind you that almost uh, everyone who was flying to space and look down on the earth uh, making point that you cannot see borders uh, from space and uh, looking at the map we, we used to have uh, borders and actually use them sometime like landmark uh, to, to find some object on the map but from space you don't see borders and uh, uh, my observation that uh, that's usually happened when you leave your city and going somewhere else you become representative of your city and people looking at you as a representative of this community living in this city. 
when you are living about uh, your country, you become the representative of your country. But when you fly up in space, you start to feel that uh, we all equal. We all are trying to find our way uh, to fly further and faster. Uh, <coughs> we all have to uh, be together to uh, to fight with uh, un not very friendly environment in space. So, <coughs> and uh, reading old books, I remember that uh, about the same brotherhood uh, was uh, between sailors. When people were in aggressive world and big waves, strong wind with very primitive equipment, <coughs> don't matter what country they represent, they help each other every time if they hear need for the help. <coughs> and for space program, uh, the program start especially in the beginning. Rocket engineering was part of uh, military programs and in many cases things was done in secret from each other. <coughs> but when we start to fly in space, when we realize that this is another world and uh, completely different rules you have to obey to survive there, uh, we start to fly together and we start to build trust to each other. And I think this is very important because uh, no matter what country you are from, if you're in the same vehicle, uh, you you have the same risk. And uh, we can succeed only if we help each other, uh, only if we work together. So I think you really uh, right word to, to say, Ambassador. Uh, realizing this, uh, every one of us uh, start to talk to other people in your country, in other country that this is an area where we work together and we should work together uh, in order to, to move forward. I think we have some broad support in the, uh, in the audience for that. Thank you, Sergey. Ander. Actually, the, the ambassador process starts already in the selection. And the ESA selection, one of the directors and one of the board said, do you realize you will become an ambassador for space? Uh, so uh, you start maybe something uh, as a dream for yourself and to, to be part of it, but you, are, you're, you will be the ambassador. Outreach is very important, and it's space is interesting for, for everybody, from 5 to 95, from engineer to, to people who have nothing with technology, because it's such a strange world. And because of that, space flight is, uh, is a beautiful platform to, to, to show how interesting technology and science is. So that's one of the aspects you, you can, you, it, people are open, open for everything that, that, that astronauts are, are, are talking about because it's such a strange world. In the same time, you have this message, science and technology is fun, uh, it creates their, their dreams, and the Earth is beautiful, but very fragile. Those two messages are always in there, and uh, well, I think our, uh, not every astronaut is maybe very happy to, to talk to, uh, to audiences, but I think this is a, a major role and uh, an important one. I think it comes with the job, this, uh, this element of outreach. That's great. So let's go with a few of the questions here from the audience. I've been trying to filter through the ones. Uh, there's a one uh, that has a little, there's a reoccurring theme in a few of these questions, so I'll ask that. Um, and uh, so th the question is, what, when you first went to space, your first moments, what were your first impressions or what surprised you? It's, there's a few of these questions. Yeah. And I know for some, uh, maybe for Chris, that moment is fairly recent. You can remember that others, you have to look uh, a little bit further back. But uh, any comments on that first impression or, or surprise of being in space? I don't think we have to look back. Even when we become 100 years old, we'd probably <laughs> know this first moment. Um, I flew together with Mike Fink. It was both our first flight, and uh, well, if you launch in the Soyuz, you don't see anything. There's a fairing, and what is it, 80 kilometers or something? The fairing goes off, you can look out. On my side, the sun came in, and so I couldn't really look out. But then Mike called Andre, look, and I turned my head to his window, and then I saw this blue curvature and a black snow space, and that was such a fantastic moment. That's what I wanted to see. If, if it would have been uh, returning at that moment, I was already happy uh, because of that special moment. Uh, it's a very short moment because then, of course, you concentrate on all the things you have to do uh, and watch. But that was very special. You never forget that. Yeah. Uh, what surprised me that uh, for something I was 
No, what I should expect still look surprising. Like Andrew said, uh, curved horizon was very surprising thing. You know that it should be, you saw a lot of pictures, but when you see it with your own eyes, uh, this is completely different expression. Yeah, I was worried after having worked in the industry for you know twenty odd years that I'd be desensit desensitized to the experience. You know, I hear uh, I said this this morning. Some people, when they go to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower for the first time, they're disappointed because it's smaller than they thought. And uh, you know, the Mona Lisa is a small painting. And I was worried. Oh, yeah, space. I've seen all the pictures, but I, I can agree that when you get up there, it's for so many reasons probably related to our our evolution of our brain and our eyes and our optical nerve and how our brain works. Uh, we, no one really in the human race has ever seen this before. And it is stranger and more interesting than you could ever imagine. So yeah, it's quite a recommended experience. Just a recommended experience. And um, I remember the first uh, time when the boosters of the Soyuz just stopped at 200 kilometers. That was after eight minutes and 55 seconds. It was just the one of the most amazing experience that I had in my life, just to experience weightlessness. Everything started to float. My hand just went up. I felt my back off the, the, the seat and looking at the right, looking at the earth from there, for first time, it was amazing. Just the colors of our planet and behind it, the deepness of the space, of space itself, and it was amazing. Just a pain that no one can paint in ever, like the picture that I will never forget in my life. And uh, it felt that the hard work, uh, the commitment that anyone that went to that uh, point in his life to see that view, it's worth it. Just make sure that if you want to reach that point in your life, anything, not only space, you have to really work hard and down the road you, you, will, you will see something amazing. Yeah, I think common theme for me as well, having wanted to be an astronaut my entire life, I was when looking out the window and seeing it for the first time, and actually not even just for the first time, for the entire seven months, it was more incredible than I could have ever imagined. And I think like everybody up here, we thought about it our whole lives and, and maybe like Chris said, worried, well, you know, we've, we're so immersed in it. We've seen everyone's pictures. We know all these people that have been. So will it, will it be really resonate that loudly? And, and it absolutely does. It's just every day looking out the cupola I would think, how is this even real that I am here with two other people or five other people or seven other people, depending on what part of the mission it was, and everybody else is down there. Everybody we know, every experience we had. And although we understand the science, we understand the physics, it's sometimes still, even at the end of the mission, difficult to believe that it's actually happening. The one thing that, that did kind of surprise me from the view was seeing the gradients of blue in the horizon. You know, we always talk about understanding how thin and tenuous that band is, that it's so fragile and we need to protect it. But I think with the, the human eye, I was really surprised by how you could see that whole gradient as it's darker blue near the earth and gets thinner and thinner and thinner and lighter, lighter, lighter blue until it disappears into the blackness. And I think you can't quite capture that in a, in a photograph or even a video. So the naked eye just really captures that differently. And, and I think the, the other most special part about it all was that that first moment was one that I shared with Hazak, you know, like Andre was saying, sharing that with Mike Fink, another first time flyer. I remember being in the Soyuz and in that moment when Haza described things just start lifting up. We looked I looked across Oleg Skripochka and he had been in space of course a few times before, so it wasn't new to him. And then I look at Haza and his big eyes were even bigger than you can see now. I mean, we were just both so in awe of that moment. It it truly is special no matter what your career has been in the past. During my first flight, uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't I did not have any chance to s uh, to see through the window on the space because I was in the center of chair and there's no way to look in the right or left window. So only using the uh, mirrors and the glass, so that's that's not very good. So uh, my, my first experience in the first uh, minutes in the weightlessness was recognize my reaction on the space flight uh, how my systems my uh, body works in uh, weightlessness and uh, pretty much I was busy with uh, controlling the space vehicle as well but uh, later on after we finish all our active uh, um, actions uh, during the flight I, I did 
opportunity to look through the windows and agree completely with uh, Jessica and all my colleagues. So I am continuing drawing their windows and flying in space every day being in space. So, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you all for those, uh, those responses. So um, there are quite a few questions from people in the audience. Um, I'm guessing younger people in the audience that would like to fly the space and are asking for, for tips and, and suggestions. I think, uh, Aza, you, you made a very important point about if you have a dream, you have to work hard for it. It's worth the effort when you, when you achieve it in the end. Beyond the work hard for it, any other suggestions? Uh, and a few questions also from people that aren't from, from countries that have large uh, astronaut programs. Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier that uh, most of the good things, all of the good things in my space career that have happened to me have, have come out of opportunities from the IAC. And I really believe that to be the case. Um, one way to get involved is, particularly if you're from a country that doesn't have a space program, is come to the events like this. I was, I showed up to Houston as a delegate. By the end of the week of my first IAC, I was actually nominated as the conference chair for the Space Generation Congress. And so by day eight, I was organizing the next year. And it was through six years of that work that I actually ended up getting invited to work at NASA Ames. So when people ask, how does an, a foreign national get a job at NASA? You go to nasa.gov slash jobs and click, uh, click apply. The first question is, are you a US citizen? So of course, going through the front door doesn't work. But by showing up and contributing to the community, volunteering, really putting your heart out there and getting involved with things and, and helping each other make, make whatever you're doing happen, workshops, reviewing papers, running you know, committees, um, organizing events, it's a way to get involved and you'll ultimately meet people who will be um, agents of your success and help you connect and find the opportunities you're really looking for. And I think in the modern world, we no longer live in a world where your place of birth completely limits you. You can make friends here. And one of the visions, I think, for space generation that I really resonate with was imagine a future where we are all friends, where the head of you know the UAE space program is friends with the head of the Chinese space program, is head, heads friends with the head of NASA. That's a future we're creating here, and it, and it comes from the community and friendship here. So just show up and get involved, and um, you, you'll find your way. Thank you. I, I think uh, that's a, a very important message. Space is a very international uh, field, and participating here can be that path to a, uh, a flight to space or, or success in general in the space world. And, and I think uh, if your path to... Uh, uh, a flight to space involves success, starting a successful space company as you've done. Um, space is a very international field and this, this provides that venue. If your path is through a, an agency and a, a national program, again, having that international outreach and connection can only help you in that selection process as well. So, uh, great. Yes, I can as just uh, want to elaborate on that one because this is really a very important subject for, especially for the youth and the next generation is I'll make it very short. You have to be curious every day. Try to learn something new. Uh, don't stay in your uh, comfort zone. If you are in that zone, that means you are not producing anything. Challenge yourself and always uh, be a part of a team. Great, thank you. So let's, let's move on. Um, so then there are a number of moon-related questions here. As you know, one of the big efforts internationally in the space community now is uh, a focus on, on moon activities, uh, more substantial return to the moon, perhaps outposts. Um, I think there are, it's high in the agenda of agencies around the world, but also private companies are looking at uh, uh, lunar missions, robotic and human lunar missions. So what are your thoughts on, on human lunar exploration and uh, there were some questions here along the lines of should the same kind of selection process that's been used for astronauts doing orbital flights be used for lunar missions or are there other things that uh, should be thought about as we go to the moon and perhaps let's just extend that 
Mars. Uh, you know, Elon Musk has his plan of sending humans to Mars uh, in a, you know, at a large scale. What are your thoughts in this general area? Okay. Oleg, let's start with you. Okay, because, uh, maybe because I'm uh, now is very much involved in this process because uh, the definitely the process of the crew selection and astronaut selection for such missions, uh, moon and behind, is a little bit different. I was saying it pretty much different from what we have now because the requirements for people who is going to fly far from Earth, from Leo, is a little bit different. Uh, because now uh, we're pretty, we are mm, in pretty good shape now, understanding how we, is we and we can uh, fly long uh, duration flights on Leo. How to manage that from medical point of view and understanding that's uh, the selection. What is the right uh, selection criteria uh, are now? But for we continue working and uh, as as well during the ISS missions and our investigations uh, to verify very significant criteria for long distance flight to the moon and to the Mars because you know uh, there is no options to escape uh, from the uh, space to the earth in case of any medical emergency what we have ability what ability we have now uh, so why was uh, maybe for professionals and I'm sure that we start flying to the moon and behind with professionals they pass we have to pass very stronger uh, selection to fly there from medical point of view and operationally as well because again and you're not very much could re rely on uh, ground controllers if you fly to the Mars for example because even the some delay about 20 minutes in one way it's uh, big uh, will almost cancel the normal conversation and ground uh, station to ground or uh, space to ground is absolutely different so uh, we have a roadmap uh, cr of critical technologies uh, we need to fly to moon and behind and so working internationally uh, to solve all the problem in getting ready for such mission okay thank you yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think we'll see with these further missions that we need to be more autonomous. That's the first thing. And of course, all of our agencies have been working on those problems with all of our previous missions, looking at, for example, sustainable food sources and being able to provide more of that in s ourselves and, s and keep that continuous instead of just sending these resupply vehicles like we do. And in terms of the astronaut selection, we are thinking a lot about these factors of, okay, do we need uh, astronauts with special specialized backgrounds or experience sets? Do we want to make sure we have a geologist, for example, when we go back to the moon? I think all of those things will be very important as we make these decisions to, to explore further. Just add that it's very exciting for us on the stage here. We have this countdown clock and giant red numbers here on the screen, and I think it all reminds us of our launch moment here as we're looking <laughs> as we're looking down. I'm not sure the when we get to zero, it'll be quite that exciting though. 16 minutes and 48 <laughs> seconds and counting. <laughs> Good. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, you know, related to related to that, there was a little bit of, of talk there about uh, being prepared physically and, and testing. Um, there were some questions here about your, uh, the effects on your, your body of flying in space. And uh, one of the questions asked what your, how long it took you to recover from your space flight experience. And, uh, and, are th and another question, are there any longer term medical effects that are lasting from that? I know we have uh, some medical doctors and biologists on the panel uh, that probably have a lot of thoughts on that. But any, any thoughts, how long it took you to recover from your space flight and are in any longer term effects? Um, I, I had a chance to fly a short duration mission and long duration mission and uh, time to recover depend on how long you fly. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we didn't know uh, what to expect, especially if you fly your first, uh, first mission, uh, you don't know how your body will uh, respond to weightlessness first and then to gravity when you return back. Uh, so, but with experience we have over many, many missions uh, now, we have basically two phases of uh, recovery. First phase is uh, basically very tightly medically uh, controlled, is about two, three weeks. 
two, three weeks, we need to return back to more or less normal life when after long duration flight you can walk normally, stay normally. Maybe not jump the way you did before the flight, but uh, for second stage of recovery, that is about a month, month and a half, uh, you return back to normal life when you can run and jump almost the way you did it uh, before the flight. Uh, after short duration flights, uh, it doesn't affect your body so much, so you basically ready to live your normal life on second, third day of the flight. You have ongoing testing for bone decalcification or anything like that? Uh, any medical? Okay. Yeah, yes, we have, but um, I would like to say it's a little different. I have to uh, answer the question in a different way. You know, so yeah, we need rec uh, rehabilitation of the space flight and the impact from uh, space flight uh, on the body. Our body uh, mostly depends on the duration of the flight, not the active phase of landing or uh, launching or landing, but mostly the weightlessness expo uh, exposition. And uh, but uh, we need to fly further to the Mars, for example, and. After the one year, about one year flight, we need to come in a good shape there and not have a rehabilitation there and, and we don't expect any rescue team over there. So we're working very hard uh, internationally to uh, create new countermeasure system during the space flight, uh, which we don't will need any rehabilitation uh, on the after that space flight. And um, probably this is the main goal of our, our international community, science medical community to create uh, such system and we work internationally on ISS and we have a s pretty good, good project we call it ISS for Mars. Uh, that means we use ISS as an analog uh, for flying to Mars. Yeah, I think the, the, the biggest problem in the long run is the radiation. Uh, I mean, we have outside of the protection of the Earth magnetic field, we talk about Moon and Mars, etc. So that that is uh, the the most interesting challenge. You don't notice that so much, except for the flashes that you see now and then. Um, but that that is an imp important one, and uh, so in that sense, uh, I think well we have to look out at age. So maybe we should send retired astronauts to the moon. How about that? That's I don't I know I about that. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I sent some competition here. I, I think I like had a very good point too about these future systems. You know, right now on the space station we have such incredible exercise equipment for weightlifting, running, so cardiovascular and also the weightlifting, which is the most important for that loading, to get that loading so that our bones don't deteriorate and we can maintain our muscle mass. And we're bringing back astronauts and cosmonauts now, really baseline, sometimes I actually had an increased muscle mass, I think, you know, we work out every day and we're not sitting around on a couch watching TV. Um, and even the bone density as well, we're maintaining that overall in most of the bones. But those pieces of equipment are incredibly large. They take up a lot of space. And if we're going to go to Mars, we're going to be much more volume and mass constrained. So these new countermeasure systems that we're developing, which hopefully you guys can help us develop, are incredibly important because we need to have that level of maintenance so that we are functional once we get to Mars. Okay, great. Um, Jessica, there's a few questions for you. And uh, if I summarize it with this one specific question, you're the only woman on this panel. Um, can you speak to your experience as an astronaut in a male-dominated field? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, we get asked this quite often. I was part of the 2013 NASA astronaut class, and that was the first time that we had equal representation. We had 50% female and 50% male. And I would say overall in our office now, we're not quite up there. We're probably more about 30, 35% female. Um, but we are moving in the right direction. You know, I think like all of the STEM fields, all of the backgrounds from which everybody in the audience comes from, we are trending that way. And so if you look at the numbers and how they line up at NASA and specifically in the astronaut office, they're in line with all of those other fields. So I don't think we're lagging behind those fields. Of course, it takes some time. You know, when we make these astronaut selections, you can't necessarily solve the problem at the top. That's why this outreach mission of ours is so important. We have to solve this problem from the bottom, from the time when children are young, and we encourage them, everybody equally, to explore in these STEM fields. So personally for me, I think I was very fortunate. I, I'd never had a moment in my life 
um, when I was younger or now when I felt like people were trying to tell me I couldn't do something because I was a woman. So I know that that's not everybody's experience, but for me, I think that helped me maintain this dream and realize that it, that it could be realistic. You know, we have challenges with things like spacesuits that are too big for us and we still have to adapt and, and use them. But again, the reason why we have those older spacesuits are because they were developed you know, before I was born. So we're still kind of tied to that anachronism from the past just because of these long development and redevelopment timelines and the technological, technological constraints when you're working in the space environment. But also there, we're trending in the right direction. The new suits that we're developing will have much more increased mobility and dexterity and will fit the first to 99th percentile um, human population. So we'll really be going forward and including everybody. And I think that's the, the most important point. Great, thank you. Um, so there were also a few questions on, uh, I guess that have to do with this, this change in uh, the space traveling world where we have now uh, private citizens being able to go into space. Uh, and those numbers are increasing quite dramatically. Chris, maybe you have some thoughts on that. But the, uh, the question is also for those that are maybe on the, uh, on the professional astronaut side, are, do you think that the term astronaut is, is a valid one to be used for all space travelers or should only be reserved for professional ones? A and I would say, in fact, I think there's probably some of the panel here that would say cosmonaut is perhaps a better term than astronaut. <laughs> for, uh, but uh, what are your thoughts on this? this uh, broadening of the field of those that are traveling into space? Well, first of all, it's not a protected title as a master's degree or a doctor's. So everybody can call himself astronaut. Me too. In that so why not? <laughs> it's not protected. <laughs> so so, uh, so that's, that's space flight uh, is, is changing. And you, I, I compare it, like many others, compare it a lot with, with aviation, for example. Uh, you have, you have the, the, the pilots, you have the, the cabin staff, you have the, the passengers. Uh, you have to know some basic things for safety, uh, but you get a differentiation uh, in, uh, in spacefarers, space travelers, uh, let's call it that way. And that's a normal development. You saw it in shipping, you saw it in aviation, now you see it in, in, uh, in space flight. So you get professional astronauts, and among them there is a lot of differences as well uh, over the years. You have the moonwalkers, the short duration, long duration, so you, get, you have payload specialists, etc. So there was already a differentiation, and, and this will be added. So you get now, uh, say, the, the space travelers in uh, the, the, the private sector, and, uh, like you have in aviation as well. That's, that's how I see it now. Uh, and I agree, cosmonaut is probably better because astronaut do not going to the stars yet. Eh? It's so next step. <laughs> next step, yeah. Um, uh, I think sometimes people asking this question, what do you think about uh, getting more and more non-professional cosmonauts flying? Uh, and they expect that we would be, uh, professional cosmonauts would be upset with uh, having new people in this area. But I think I agree with Andrea. Uh, it's completely normal process and uh, Newcomers, they not replace professionals. They add to professional field another um, dimension, I would say. And I agree, exactly the same happened in aviation when uh, in the beginning of aviation only professional pilots were flying and then uh, we have so reliable airplanes that a uh, regular person can fly over the Atlantic, over the North Pole, uh, and it's not a big deal now. So, uh, but still we have professionals who, who are flying. Uh, and what I expect that even professionals will also split uh, about the same way we split in uh, aviation. When you have uh, regular pilots who are flying uh, uh, cargo airplanes, passenger airplanes, and uh, some part of test pilots who are testing new equipment, they have probably more uh, skills, they have more risk, uh, but that's why they have more skills to, to be able to take this risk and make it uh, reasonable. So basically the same will uh, stay in, in space flights. Uh, Earth uh, parabolic flights um, became normal and we see actually the, the first area when uh, uh, commercial uh, tourists will fly and uh, it's much more available for a regular person than orbital flight. Uh, but even orbit becomes uh, normal this time. Uh, so I think for, for future flights, when you fly to moon, when you fly beyond 
uh, law as well, but uh, basically professionals will pave the way, but sooner or later regular citizen will also join this. So it's kind of normal way. I think it's nothing unusual. Okay. Uh, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think what we're seeing really is a, is a change of roles, right? It used to take an entire country to send one person, you know, you know, the entire Soviet Union to send Yuri Gagarin into space and, you know, the United States years of work to send Alan Shepard and, and so on. So the fact that it's really just now new, what we're really seeing is new um, entities, new groups of people gaining s space capability that used to be the domain of superpowers. And I think that's really important. And so even though some of the trips, you know, uh, Virgin Galactics and, and, um, and uh, Blue Origins trips are relatively short, it's just the beginning. This is the barnstorming to your airplane analogy. This is the era of pilots trying strange new things with airplanes. But 50 years, I, so from, uh, was it from the Wright brothers' first flight of the airplane to the uh, 747 was 48 or 49 years. Um, and I think so in the same time frame, we'll actually see this first little stuff that has been characterized as tourism now become large scale commercial and civilian activity, and you know, I think within you know 50 years, we'll have thousands and thousands of people who have been to space um, through different means, whether it's their company doing something in space to just visiting, like I did. So I, I think it's it's every role that human race has on the ground will have in space, and maybe we need new titles like astro doctor, and you know, astro lawyer, and astro plumber, and astro electrician, and astro builder. And people need to build things on, on uh, you know, on the moon, on Mars. We need to conduct all of the human activities on the ground. We're going to do those in space. So I think every role that we have on the ground will become a space title. Yeah, and I, I do agree. We do have a lot to think about in terms of these these terms. But one thing I hear quite a bit that I that I don't really like, I guess, is the distinction of civilian astronaut and professional astronaut. So I'm a civilian astronaut. NASA is a government agency, but we are not a military agency. So at least in the U.S., you know, we, we would say we have military astronauts and civilian astronauts. So to say that this is a mission of just civilian astronauts, I think, is not really correct. Um, maybe professional and private's better or, or whatever kind of emergence of terms we have. But, but I'm also a civilian astronaut. So. <laughs> Good point there. Um, someone uh, asked a question here about... Uh, um, citizen scientist astronauts um, and uh, clearly you've inspired a lot of this audience and they're thinking about ways to get into space and so there's a question about if you think the uh, the demand for citizen science astronauts for microgravity experiments or other commercial applications will be increasing in the years to come I suspect we all agree that that demand will be increasing but uh, question let me how fast sorry the question how fast this increase will happen because yeah. a long time ago in both U.S. program and uh, Russian program, we have uh, payload specialists uh, uh, who flew on shuttle and these people were not responsible and not very trained to control vehicle, but they were trained to do experiments in space. In Russian program, we also have uh, part of professional, it can be professional cosmonaut, but uh, they also kind of payload specialist uh, uh, to do experiment on Russian side. So uh, it will increase for sure. Question how fast? Well, and so this was the, the you know, the countdown clock is almost at the blast off mark there. I would like to ask a, a final question related to this. Um, so looking around, I'm not sure how many people we have here in the room in the audience, maybe let's say 300 or so. What percentage of this audience do you think will be able to travel into space in their lifetimes? I want a, a hard number of your, in your experience, it what do you think, you mean it, is it like uh, now, 5%? Now or in the no, no. near future? In their lifetime. In their lifetime, yeah, I don't know the age of all the people. Yes, well, <laughs> there, there's <laughs> different, <laughs> different <laughs> things. How many, pe how many people the, want to go? Profile of very, yeah, very high, actually. Wait, high, high means like 5% or 20%? I mean, 5, 10 percent. Yeah, let's see a so show of hands of how many people want to go first of all, and then we can refine our numbers. I think much higher. Okay. I mean, so the, 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 the official those, want to go. those that want to go, I think we're, we're, we're approaching 90 percent here. Yes. It's, it's I think from a physiological point of view, uh, it depends on what kind of flight you mean. Uh, is it long duration, uh, all, the, all the way to Mars, or, or, any, or any. a suborbital flight? Uh, 
to 90% can do a suborbital, I think. Serious. That's what I expect. 90? So will it be that's affordable for 90% of people? I guess that's the big <laughs> that question. That's the question, yeah. There is a lot of, of aspect for that. I believe the, the accessibility for space is being it's increased every day with the new vehicles, new private companies coming uh, online, but uh, I think probably I would say 50%. 50%? I guess everyone who really want to do to fly to space could f could do that in the future because now the open opportunity to do that I uh, don't need to be the part of the professional or uh, agency government agency just uh, just earn the money or just make the experience or find a goal what you really need to be in space and uh, fly to uh, using the private uh, uh, companies private uh, system to fly to space and do what you want to do. And actually I was surprised to see many people raise their hands because usually in average audience it's much less percentage. So maybe because we are at this conference, that's the reason why. I, I think you're among the, uh, the family of space enthusiasts at this conference for sure. So you've heard it here. I think the predictions were somewhere between 50 and anybody who would really desire will be able to do that. So if you if you have interest to travel to space, if you've been inspired here, I think your chances are good. Chris, you have a... I just wanted to um, add one, one thought on that topic. Um, I realized, talking to some friends yesterday, that space travel is now accessible enough, whether it be orbital, say, through SpaceX or suborbital through one of the other companies, that there's enough people in this room that you could raise money to send one person from this room today. And that's really new. There are enough people here to make that happen, and so yeah, is it expensive? It's certainly still, you know, on, on the, and on the in terms of like average income of people around the world, it's staggeringly expensive still, but it's no longer impossible. And so, you know, when you go home, think about that idea that you can, you know, your university could run a fundraiser and raise enough money to send someone randomly selected from your class, um, which is pretty mind-blowing to think about. So I encourage you to actually take that concept seriously and send someone. We're in a very transformative time in the space world, I would say. So with that, uh, let's close the panel. This has been uh, great. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us here. And thank you, the audience, for your questions as well.